Chapter 9. To concentrate well is not sufficient. We must also concentrate with the greatest possible capacity, and therefore we should train ourselves to concentrate with the whole mind, or to express more and more of life and power in every thought and action. But the average mind makes actual use of only a small fraction of what is possible in ability and power, and that is one reason why the concentrated efforts of such a mind are so weak or utterly futile. Where concentration is weak and imperfect, we always find most of the mind in a dormant state and vice versa. Where concentration is exceptional, we find marked activity all through the mental world. The problem, then, is to awaken more of the mind and express more of the power of the mind in everything we do, a problem that would largely solve itself if we would abandon completely all half-hearted modes of thought and action. We should make it a practice to express the whole self in everything we do, think or say, and the increase in mental capacity would be remarkable. We should eliminate indifferent absolutely. Whatever we turn to the left or the right, we should turn with all we have in feeling, purpose, and will. Wherever we act, we should be a power and aim to make all action constructive, conducive to greater capacity for action tomorrow. There is no gain in saving up power for another day. If we use it all now, we will still have more when the other day arrives. The power that is generated in the system today should be used today, not scattered, but used, used in constructive expression. And the law is that the more power we use today, the more we shall have tomorrow. When we think, we should not simply think with the brain, but think with every force and element in the entire personality. There is nothing that will increase mental capacity so quickly and so effectively as the training of the mind to use the whole personality in every thought and expression. And when the mind can, in concentration, draw upon the entire personality for power, conscious and subconscious, we can imagine what the force of such concentration will be. Our principal object, therefore, should be in this connection to awaken the vast regions of dormant energy all through the mental world and express more and more of this new energy in everything we do. Thus we provide concentration with an ever-increasing measure of power. A most excellent practice in order to express more of the mind in every thought and action is to lay hold upon all the energy of the mind with deep feeling and will and actually take up that energy as we would take up a book with the hand and place it where we want it now. This can readily be done, and with practice we will find that we can control our mental energies just as effectively as we control the movement of hands and feet. When this control is gained, we shall be able at any time to increase the expression of the power of mind, thereby increasing directly the power of concentration. And when we realize that even exceptional minds use less than 5% of their latent energies, we gain some idea of the vastness of our own possibility. To further this increase in mental capacity, we should give definite and frequent direction to the subconscious for this particular purpose. In fact, there is nothing that will avail so much for such a purpose, which fact we can readily appreciate when we note what the subconscious is and what it can do. We should make it a daily practice, therefore, to direct the subconscious to awaken the whole mind and to express in constructive action the full power and capacity of the mind. Remarkable increase will be realized as the weeks pass, both in working capacity and in thinking power. Then we should proceed farther and direct the subconscious to develop and perfect concentration itself, and we shall be amazed at what can be done in this regard. We know that the subconscious can do anything within the range of human possibility if properly directed. Therefore, the creative power of the great within can build for us all the most effective and most perfect concentration conceivable. This marvelous power is latent in every mind, waiting to be used with intelligence, super-effort, and real faith. Chapter 10. In the science and art of concentration, it is the deeper forces and the finer energies of mind and personality with which we deal directly, and therefore we increase the power of concentration as we acquire the ability to take up or control these forces of the will. And according to our purpose or desire, to accomplish this, we must gain interior hold of these forces, because they do not respond to any action of mind or will that is merely superficial. And here we find another reason why it is only the few who really can concentrate. It is only the few who think deeply and who cause the actions of the mind to work among the powerful undercurrents of life, thought and mentality. But anyone can acquire this power. And the first door step towards the end is to gain the interior hold of the finer energies of the mind. When we can take hold of the forces of the mental world and direct or sway these forces in any way desired, just as we sway or extend the arm in any mode or direction desired, when we can do this, then we are beginning to acquire the power of real concentration. This inner mastery of the forces and energies of the mind is a purely subjective process and is developed only as we learn to act consciously and positively in what we may term the inner field of thought. 
consciousness and mind action. And although there are many who can do and act to some extent in this inner field, the majority can acquire this power only through extensive practice. The value of this power, even aside from that of concentration, is very great, especially in connection with the creation of effective and brilliant ideas. For the fact is that it is only in this inner field of mind and thought that brilliant ideas are created. And besides, every mental creative process of genuine worth depends directly upon the action of these finer energies. If we would develop the real power of concentration, therefore, and also master the art of creating brilliant ideas, we must think and act in the consciousness of the inner field of mentality and gain more and more this interior hold upon the forces of mind and personality. To advance in this direction, we should endeavor frequently to take up and apply the deeper forces of the mental system, that is, to take positive hold of those forces with mind and will, directing them first upon one sphere in the mental world, then upon some other sphere, to move these forces to and fro as we may desire, to cause them to move in circles one moment and in a straight line, either towards a depth or to the heights of the mental world the next moment, to gather them in large groups or in small groups according to desire, to focalize them all upon any subject or idea we have in mind, and to see how long we can continue such focalization without losing interest in the subject or becoming oblivious to our surrounding. And here we should remember that the moment we lose interest in the subject before us, that moment we cease to concentrate. And also, that the moment we become oblivious to our surroundings, that moment we cease to concentrate. Concentration involves, on the one hand, undivided attention to the subject or object before us, and on the other hand, complete wide awakeness to everything going on among our surrounding. The moment we become oblivious to our surrounding, the real power of concentration is lost for the time being. It is very important, therefore, that we continue to be wide awake, both to the objective and to the subjective, in fact, in as wide and deep and large a sphere as possible. To gain this interior hold upon the deeper force of the mind, it is continuous practice that will give the power desired, and every imaginal method should be employed, because the more ways through which we can handle, sway, or manipulate these forces, the greater will become our conscious hold upon these forces. And when this conscious hold becomes remarkable, then we can apply these forces anywhere at any time, and with full capacity and power. In other words, we shall be able to concentrate perfectly and turn on the full current of all the talent, energy, and power we possess. An excellent practice is to turn attention frequently upon the great within, concentrating the deeper forces of the mind upon the vast and marvelous possibilities that exist in the fathomless depth of the mental world. This practice will not only aid the mind remarkably in gaining this interior hold upon the finer energies, but will also awaken latent forces and new talents, and will invariably arouse increased capacity and power in every faculty and talent we may be using now. When we find that the faculties and talents we employ do not possess sufficient force and capacity to make that work a success, it is most important that we take up the above practice and do so with determination and enthusiasm. We will soon experience most marked improvement, the mental engine will have more steam, and we shall be able to speed on with twice and thrice the usual cargo of plans, propositions, and achievements. Furthermore, this practice will enlarge immensely the field for concentration, and here it is important to remember that the greater the scope and range of the mental world of which we are actively conscious, the greater becomes the power of concentration. Every faculty or power in the mind gains exceptional advantages when given more and more to work with, and the practice of concentrating frequently upon the great within will give every faculty more to work with, besides giving the mind as a whole an ever-increasing world for attainment and achievement. End of chapter.